You are listening to the People Centric Podcast, where we talk through the toughest challenges that people face at work and give practical advice to fixing those challenges. Thanks for joining our movement to create workplaces that are happier, healthier, aligned, and empowered by putting people at the center of all that we do. Hey, people-centric leaders, we keep hearing all over the news, all of these new buzzwords that are out there, things like ghosting and quiet quitting. And we started thinking about all of this stuff and thinking, what does ghosting and quiet quitting really look like? And Diana found this cool article uh, that was posted out on NBCNews.com, I believe, just to give the, give the shout out to that. And it said, from ghosting to quiet quitting, we're avoiding conflict, and that's not healthy. And man, we so agree with that. So today, we're going to talk a little bit about some of these trends in business, talking about generations a little bit, talking about like these terms of ghosting and quiet quitting, and how employees are responding, and how managers are responding, and how owners are responding. Uh, and we're even going to talk a little bit about this nursing strike that's occurring out in New York here and a little some of the things that the lessons that could be learned from that. And all of some of this stuff extends from the idea of avoiding conflict. So we're going to jump into this. We're going to jump in. We're going to get we're going to fight. We're going to fight each other. Bethany, are you ready to fight? Mm, it de- I guess it depends on what we're going to fight about. So that's the spirit. I could tell you're going to win off the bat. <laughs> don't want to fight her. Yeah. I don't fight, yeah. Vicious. With those vicious. You just wait, Matt. You just wait. I, I feel you like you reason. intentionally asked to fight Bethany Taft because no one asked to fight me. Diana, mm-hmm. I just think you're doing a great job. And I just want to thank okay. you for everything that you do for our team. <laughs> Diana, please don't be mad at me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> please don't hurt me. And Stephanie's smart. She's jumped in here. Only been with the team for what, three months now? Is it three months? Are you in your third month? Something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Something like that. And she knows not to cross Diana. It's the first page of our employee manual. Yeah. Yeah. But but we have to be able to, in order to have a great team, guys, we have to have this healthy conflict. So in order to talk about conflict in teams and this idea of ghosting and quiet quitting is our host, Matt Griswold. So Matt, you want to walk us through this topic a little bit? Oh, and I'm Don Harkey. I'm supposed to say that too. People said, I'm not saying who I am. I'm Don Harkey. Matt Griswold, take us away. Thank you, Don. Uh, I'm not opposed to fighting Diana. If anybody knows Diana, you can just put her in your little pocket. She's, you know, fun-sized and and uh, she's, you know, she might hit you, take you out at the knees. Is that about, is that about, is that about right? I will cut someone. Please don't pick me up and put me in your pocket. It will go poorly for you. All right. She's an acquired taste, everybody. Uh, <laughs> good, to, good to be back with you. Uh, it, talking about this and and dang, I don't know if it's just me. And maybe some people are in the same boat as I am. I'm tired of hearing about things like quiet quitting. <laughs> All of these these buzzwords that are out there right now, and I know the employers that are dealing with it are super tired of hearing these buzzwords and what else can we make up, right? But there is a root to this. There is a foundational point to this and to many of these other buzzwords, and it's this idea of conflict and avoiding conflict. We have an hour-long presentation that we give on avoiding conflict. Uh, I know I know we're familiar with that as well, too. Sometimes organizations ask us to go do some leadership development things and avoiding conflict or conflict avoidance is one of those things that they ask for. And so I'm going to walk through maybe some of the thoughts of that idea there of the of a kind of a presentation that we would give normally. You all are the participants. And as always, as we're walking through this idea of avoiding conflict, I want you to consider maybe yourself in some of these scenarios, maybe yourself, your situation, your team, your department, your company in these scenarios as well. Don, were you going to add something? Yeah, I thought maybe, Matt, before we jumped deep into the conflict piece of that, I realized I used a couple of terms about defining those things. And so we get feedback occasionally from our listeners who say, please define terms when you go to use those. And we just said the term quiet quitting was the first one that we put out there. So I thought we should ask our team, like, what is quiet quitting? What does that mean? And apparently our team doesn't so, know, so nobody knows. I'll answer. Oh, no. Diana knows, okay. Ultimately, quiet quitting is just being disengaged, right? It's the people who are like, I have worked my butt off. I have asked for things. I have done stuff. I put in the extra hours. And you know what? 
it doesn't matter. Nobody seems to care. Nobody seems to recognize it. So I am quiet quitting. So I'm done, but I'm not going to tell anybody that I quit. I'm still going to accept the paycheck. I'm still going to take up the space. I'm still going to go to the job and I'm going to do the minimal stuff. And then I'm going to move on. Yeah, Yeah. that's that's term quiet quitting, which sounds like is a new term and a very, very old concept. That is not a new thing that has been around. I've heard people say, now the younger generation is starting to quiet quit. And it's like, no, no, no. Statistically by Gallup says 50 to 51%. Somewhere in that ballpark of people are disengaged or could be considered to be quiet quitters. I'll bet several of you listening right now are quiet quitters or have already quiet quit, right? And it's why don't you go to your boss and tell them that you're frustrated with the job and that you think you could do a lot more? Maybe you did it once and maybe you got burned or maybe it's just not worth the conflict. So that's part of that. The other term that we've talked about is ghosting. Does anybody, there's a risk here of asking, does anybody want to say what ghosting is? I'll say what ghosting is. I'll be brave. I've been ghosted many times. Um, I used to do corporate recruiting um, for a big financial firm and got ghosted all the time by people who would apply for jobs, be excited to talk about jobs, even like second or third interviews. And so what would happen is I just, it would almost like, I would just never hear from this person again. They stopped responding to any communications, um, never wouldn't answer the phone. They didn't show up scheduled in-person meetings. It was like they just poof, gone. They don't exist anymore, which is where the probably millennial term ghosting comes from (laughs) is they are no longer with us. They're not, they've disappeared. They are no longer on the radar. They're out. I had a friend of mine who talked about another friend who had said something in a discussion that they didn't like, and they were really, really ticked about it. And so they said that they were going to ghost them. And they said it was a deliberate act and there was going to be no feedback to that person. They were getting messages. They were not ignoring phone calls. They're ignoring emails, all those different things. And that has become, again, I think that's not a new concept. I think that's been around for a long time. It's just now that it's a stated and open strategy of how we deal with each other. That's kind of interesting. And I think with all the technology, like we can see that messages were read and we know that they heard the phone call and like things went through. I saw the red receipt. So I think it's just a little easier to like intentionally be ghosted. (laughs) Well, and I think it's easier to ghost people now, right? Like it used to be our only form of communication was a phone call and we didn't have caller ID. So you had to answer someone to leave you a message on your answering machine or something like that. And now we have so many forms of communication. Um, It's really easy to not respond to an email. It's pretty easy to not respond to a social media message or a text. I think we've just made it really easy for people to not reach back out. Especially for some people, right, Diana? Anyway, we'll move forward. Um, (laughs) I don't ghost people. (laughs) Anyway, there was I, one time I, I, that I spent four minutes before I got back to Matt and his whole life exploded. Thank God I wasn't dying. That's what I said. Thank God it was an emergency and I wasn't dying. Any, anyway, you guys, you, 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 Bethany, she, she's, she's who you would call if you were in an emergency. <laughs> well, what about your wife? Like, that's a whole other podcast. Uh, 2,500 because... miles away, Matt. What do you want me to do for you? <laughs> Yeah, well, you know, that's uh, again, we can talk about that later. I could fill an hour, uh, maybe talking about them. Yeah, if you um, need to learn more about this special relationship, they did do a whole podcast together, which is really <laughs> enlightening. And I highly right. suggest you find it if you haven't listened to it. Yeah, and we nearly died together on a turbulent plane, but I digress. So, uh, these, these buzzwords, these buzzwords uh, are, are again, they're common, they're common uh, knowledge. They're kind of common language. I would just throw this little nugget out there too. Cause we go, when we speak at a lot of events and we hear, especially the people who are responsible for hiring, they use that ghosted term quite a bit. I will say this, it's not always on the applicant. It's sometimes on the organization because you guys drag your feet sometimes before you make a decision and you cannot do that in this day and age. That's a whole other podcast too, right? Those people have options. If you're going to make, if you're going to move, then you better move uh, because they have options too. So it's not always their fault. Uh, Quit putting the blame uh, that away there. So let's talk about this idea of conflict. 
I would uh, venture to say most of the uh, listeners right now, most of you listening, um, maybe have a relationship right now that is uh, a little turbulent, maybe, or maybe you have some conflict already within the workplace. Maybe it's somebody who was close, they're not close anymore. Maybe it's a manager. Maybe it's a manager's manager. Maybe it's like this employee to ownership uh, the, the kind of relationship there uh, too. this us versus them mentality. But let's talk maybe foundationally of uh, you know this uh, this idea of why why conflict in the in the workplace is bad. Like, what are the what are the things that you are going to see or feel or observe uh, with conflict in the workplace? And I'll throw that to anybody. Like, what are the types of things you are going to pick up on if that is there? I think conflict is just generally uncomfortable, right? There's when you go to work and you're like, oh, I have to I have to deal with this person or this thing that is happening, I think you generally feel uncomfortable doing that. I don't know anyone who really genuinely goes into conflict with good intent and says, I love conflict. I love being uncomfortable. I love having this hard conversation. Yeah. I think it really does cause a lot of us a little anxiety and put us outside our comfort zone. You know, having said that though, too, I think it's a sliding scale. I, th I think there's some people, whenever I'm doing this for groups or whenever I'm doing this, uh, like a leadership development seminar kind of a thing, I always ask, like, how many of you are conflict adverse? Like you hear conflict or you see it and you just walk the other direction. I'm doing everything I can to avoid that thing. And then I realized that they sheepishly kind of raised their hand, a portion of them. And I realized I just asked them a very intimidating question in front of their peers, which was also maybe conflict. And so I have to apologize immediately. But then there's another side of this. There's another group in there that's like conflict. No, bring it in here. I will punch it right in the face in front of everybody right now. Let's do this, right? And so it's a sliding scale. If I'm that person who's low on the scale of conflict, then I'm probably, I, I, I'm probably much more sensitive to maybe things that are perceived. Like, you know, Diana, you were using an example the other day of, of the boss just wanted to have a conversation with the employee just to be able to maybe check understanding of where they were coming from. And the employee was like, whoa, I don't <laughs> calm down. I don't want to get involved in, in that. Like, what are they trying, what are they going for? What are they trying to go for? And if I'm that person who maybe is on the lower side of that scale, I'm, I'm maybe much more sensitive to perceived conflict than some of the others. The other side of that too, is if I'm on the higher side of that, if conflict doesn't necessarily bother me. And when I say conflict, it doesn't mean physical altercations, right? I mean, it can mean very direct conversations or very direct in my messaging where you're at, you're giving directions or commands, maybe, at, maybe rather than asking questions of, of somebody, if I'm on that side of it, you might not be aware that you are creating other little pockets of conflict because you're just going about your day. I'm not trying to start fights with anybody. We're just doing work. This is how I work. This is how I accomplish things. But to the initial question of if there is conflict there, let me ask a two-part question then. Uh, what are the things that you might observe at, like from a team dynamic? I'll throw one out there. They're probably uh, kind of in a shell. They're probably not working together. They might be more isolated in their working. Uh, they're not looking for opportunities to kind of cross-functionally work. Um, but then the other part of that question might be too, what are some of those common ways that people tend to avoid conflict as well that maybe you've observed in the workplace? Who'd like to start? I'm not thinking the first thing about what's the, what's the effect of the team or what do you see on the team? And I think what you see is what we talk about quite a bit that's important for every team is the psychological safety and conflict can threaten that. It can threaten that, but avoidance of conflict always threatens that. And let me, let's distinguish between the two things, right? Conflict itself is Diana and I have, I don't know, Diana, why we're keeping picking on you, but we just pick on me. Diana and I have disagreements from time to time on a direction or a thing that we need to do. Diana and I have a, just, we, we talk about it. We said, that's conflict. That's a form of conflict. And we can sit down and talk about it and argue about it and say, I don't know what you're trying to get at. I don't know what the direction is. It can be emotional. It can be heated, all those different things, but there's a discussion that happens. That's the actual conflict, right? So if we avoided that conversation, then what happens is the team kind of still knows that it's there typically, because we're good at picking up body language. We're good at picking up. It's weird. Don and Diana aren't talking to each other right now. That's odd. I wonder why they're not talking to each other. Or if somebody will ask a question, everybody kind of has that look on that smirk on their face of like, I have things to say, but I ain't going to say it. And then what happens with that happens is then people say, well, what else can I not say? What else can I not bring up? And the trust is started to erode, where if you have the conflict, and you have it successfully, then it builds the trust. Like Diane and I have had many arguments and discussions on different things, and most of them have been very productive, unless it has to do with directions while driving down the highway, because Diana doesn't do that very well. I'm not a navigator, 
on real roads. If you want to navigate a business, fine. You want to navigate roads. Don't ask me. That was the only time I think I've been. <laughs> True story. In, uh, Diana and I stayed together in uh, New Jersey with a client in New Jersey. And for three days in a row, we left the hotel, turned right. For three days in a row, we left the hotel, turned right. Uh, hotel, turned right. Walk a few blocks and we're there. Day four. For whatever reason, Diana left the hotel and turned left. And I watched her walk for about 10 or 12 feet. And I was like, where are you going? For three days, we've gone the same the same path. That's a true story. Yep, that's a, that is a, a true story. I'm true a story. bad, I have no cognitive map, okay? Yeah. This is why whenever she travels alone, we're like, Diana, you doing okay? Diana, did you, did you find that flight? Okay, Diana, what city are you in? What do you see around you I right now? I own just fine. <laughs> We stick air tags to her forehead so we can find her when she goes. <laughs> Don, you yeah. talked about Don. You talked about this idea of of the avoidance, and I think for uh, avoiding the conflict, I think this is what I've seen internally. I think if if there's conflict that's avoided, it takes a little bit to kind of recognize the frustration that's festering below the surface. And you might ask people, you and I had an example of this. We don't need to mention any names, but you and I had an example of this. We were supposed to work with a group. We were supposed to work with a department that that an organization had reached reached out to us. And they're like, there's a little miscommunication in there. There's a little division in there in that department. So we just kind of want to uncover that. Great. That works. I called the manager of the, you know, the, the, uh, the manager of that group. I'll just say that. That if I can speak in code. And uh, I said, I understand there's a little division that we need to work through. And they're, they, their first question is like, what do you mean? What, what, what's the division? I don't understand. What, what is it that's what's going on? The silos. And I immediately started backpedaling going, did I not hear this correctly? Long story short, no, there was division. There was a lot of division, but nobody had told the manager of that group there, which made for a, a fun session. So there's this festering period of the unknown before it gets there. Bethany? Yeah, I was going to add to that because sometimes I think that conflict uh, avoidance isn't always as obvious. Yeah, sometimes it's sometimes you might have this culture where it's like everybody's really positive, but that's the problem is that everybody's really positive and nobody yeah. wants to talk about the hard things. And so then when so often for us, at least from our side of this, is like we'll work with these these this, these organizations, these, these teams, and they're just, they're really great people. They're so much fun. They're so kind and warm. Um, but then we start engaging them and we get these like side calls from different people in the team. That's like, oh my gosh, I have so much to tell you. And we're like, oh, where has this been? And why aren't you guys talking about this in your meetings? And like, when are you guys communicating about this? And the, and the answer is we're not at all. Um, we just really don't want to hurt each other's feelings. And so we just don't talk about it. Oh, we can't hear you, Matt. I've seen some calls and, or I've seen some, and Matt, we lost his audio for a minute. So he's going to have to reset his microphone. So I'm jumping in to help him there. A little bit minor technical glitch, no problem there. Um, I've seen sometimes when you're trying to avoid conflict, over a while and like you said it becomes overly friendly that it also kind of builds like this pressure inside the team and then it comes out in weird places you know somebody like in the break room oh they didn't do the dishes again i can't believe that person is always da -da 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 -da. and it's like was that the root like is it the dishes really the problem here and it's like no it's actually because of something within their job responsibility that they didn't do or some conflict that happened before and it creates we've talked a lot about stories unaddressed un, unaddressed conflict helps people become misaligned in the stories that they tell and if you go too far down the road in that story as we've talked about then the story that's in your head about that other person you start to look for evidence to support that story and what's more is you find evidence to support that story so your boss says something to you that you consider to be rude you don't address it your boss didn't know they were wasn't trying to be rude about it and you think, oh, my boss is just rude. And my boss is a jerk. And then everything your boss does is, a, is, is shows that they're a jerk. So I think that's how it shows up too, is in pressure. Sometimes it shows up in weird situations. Like there's something else going on here. It's not the thing that we're arguing about right now. Yeah. I was going to like tie into that a little bit, how we were talking about how you and I have conflict. And I think it could be easy for me to say the story of like, well, Don never listens to me or Don doesn't take my professional advice or whatever. But instead, when we have that conflict, because we do intentionally do that and intentionally discuss the things where we're not aligned, we end up staying very aligned because we get to hear what each person is thinking. Yeah. I think teams that avoid conflict also avoid the opportunity to build trust. 
I think that's how you build trust is you work through conflict. If you've worked through conflict and you've worked through things, and again, Diana, I'm using you and I as an example because we worked together for about 10 years now. It's it's the areas when you fought side by side with somebody and completely disagreed and completely gone different directions from each other and still find common ground in that and then work through that. What I mean, then you build out and you realize anything that happens, you're like, oh, we can deal with that. That's no problem. And I think that's really good. So I think that's another problem with the conflict avoidance. Yeah, I think one of the reasons that conflict gets such a bad rap in that sense is because when people think about it, they're like, well, it's going to be this showdown and it's going to get nasty. And like, they're going to say mean things to me. And I might say mean things back because then I would be justified in saying my mean thing. And I think that if people can kind of remove that, because again, if, if you know this person and you trust this person, you guys should be able to have this conversation and give that feedback or, or share something with kindness. I think that's one of, again, the big misconceptions about conflict is that it has to be just this huge negative event. Like why couldn't it just be a conversation where two people who respect each other, or even maybe if we don't have that trust, we respect each other's roles within the organization to have a conversation about what's not working here because we both want it to be better versus like, it has to be this drag out personal thing where we're either going to come out of it and there's a winner and a loser, you know, like why couldn't we both win? Can I piggyback on that or maybe ask a secondary question if I'm using facilitary uh, facilitation yes. terms here? Let me ask a second second level question here. So if that's what we want to do, if that's what we want to be able to to not come in as a knockout, drag out fight, uh, what are some good best practices to maybe start a conversation? Like, I think we've made the foundation for here's the conflict. Everybody understands that. But what if we want to push past that? What if there is some conflict I need to address? Stephanie, I think it's making a good point of saying, I understand one of the fears of that is we're not comfortable with it in the first place, like Diana talked about. I also, I understand another one of those fears is like, it's going to get ugly and it doesn't have to get ugly. I just have a, I just have something that needs to change, uh, whatever that looks like. So maybe what are some best practices to be able to start that conversation. So maybe it starts off on the right foot. Yeah. I mean, I would say like, if you're going to initiate the conversation and lead it the way you want it to go, like come in and be a little vulnerable. Like if you're struggling with someone and, and maybe they did something that made you upset to be like, Hey, this happened last week. And it didn't feel, didn't feel super good to me. Like I wanted to talk to you because I I've been thinking about it. Like, how, how did you feel that that went and open it up? And it's just a conversation versus an accusation of, Hey, you did this last week and that was wrong. And that made me mad. You know, if you do a lot of like the finger pointy language, then other people's walls instantly and their guard goes up. Um, so I think that's probably one of, from my perspective, things that's worked well for me of having these conversation is if I can come down, come in with my guard down and willing to be a little bit vulnerable and not assuming that I was right. Yeah. Um, And I think just with your guard down and I'm going to throw it to Diana here too, but in order to make sure that my guard is down, it's probably another good best practice not to do it when right after the, you know, when the, when the emotion is high, maybe take a minute, take a lap, take a drink, take a night, there and just kind of process that. So I don't go into it just with guns a blazing. You know what I mean? Sorry, Diana, go ahead. No, those are so right. So I love both of those. Yeah. Um, I also go into it with the question mindset, right? I'm going to go in and ask questions and not accuse things. I want to ask the good questions. I want to hear the other side. And I want to also believe that I might be wrong. If I go into it with staunchly believing that I'm right and that I'm going to convince someone to change their mind, it's probably not going to go so, so well. So I go into it asking questions and knowing that I might be wrong. What a good best practice that is. I think that's something something to keep in mind um, as well. Recognizing, you know, perhaps you've been frustrated about this the whole time. Uh, Maybe that person is oblivious to the fact that you're frustrated. They don't even know that they're doing something wrong. And then you can imagine that scenario where they come in and you're like, okay, seriously, we've got to figure this out. But you might only have half the story. And chances are that's true. You only have half the story. And so understanding, okay, so what am I missing? Might be a good, uh, one of those good first questions to be able to ask too. Don, what were you going to add? I like, I like that approach. You really need to talk about all, all you can talk about is yourself and your perspective. Uh, One of the things we talk about quite a bit is don't judge the other person's intentions, right? So go into it with a curious mindset to ask questions, to pull information from the other person, rather than you telling the other person why they're doing what they're doing. 
for example, we often use the supervisor example of like an employee is coming to work five minutes late every day. Um, we've had we've heard supervisors say, okay, well, I'm going to open up the conversation. First of all, it's a difficult conversation with the employee. I don't want them to hate me, but I want to talk to them. So I'm saying, so I know you don't care about your job very much, but why are you late to you know, that kind of thing that psychologically immediately shuts us down when somebody else tells us what we are thinking. That is a very difficult pill for all of us to swallow mentally. So what you want to do is do more of like what we've talked about here a little bit. And the examples that we've used is just to share, I observed this and I want to get your feedback on it. This is what it did and being vulnerable, like Stephanie said, and then just share your observations and then say, I want, you know, but you add to it. I don't know why that was said. I don't know why that was done. You tell me what was going on with that or what I could do better because I just trying to understand the situation a little bit better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think Stephanie said it earlier too, but I think it's really important to be able to try to find like common ground with people as well to say like, this is where we, I think we both want to get here. Like this is the, this is the outcome that I think we both are, are hoping to achieve. And there seems to be a breakdown somewhere. And so trying to like come at it at that way to say like, really, I think we're on the same team. I think we're working towards the, the same goals. We're just running into some kind of issue and then being able to ask those questions like, like you guys stated. Yeah. And I think, I think Bethany, what you're describing also there is let's define what winning this conversation looks like. Uh, because if my motivation is to go in and to completely change your mind, so you think, see things my way, and now you start doing things my way, you probably already lost just a little bit. Like, I think we need to define mutually what winning looks like and what mutually, why we're having the conversation. There's probably some equal frustrations on the other side of that conversation, if it really has been going on for a while, that they would like to also bring up. So making yourself vulnerable, like Stephanie had mentioned earlier, is, is a great best practice. But defining what winning looks like, uh, you know, according to what Bethany is talking about there, where are we ultimately going to land? This is my motivation for needing to have this conversation. It's not because I think you're a bad person. It's not because I think you're completely wrong. I might be wrong to use Diana's uh, you know, take there too, right? I might, I, I might be wrong, but this is why I'm frustrated. And this is why I want to know why I needed to bring it up. Don? I think a lot of times we think that conflict of, we think of it as like the old Dr. Seuss, the North who and the South who, right? They're walking together and one only goes North and one goes South and they run into each other and neither one of them will go East or West. So they just have to stand each other. Like we think of conflict as I think it's this way and you think it's this way and it's a fight, but actually in my experience, and I think you all would agree with this, a lot of the conflict that we actually see is more of teams that are just misaligned with each other. It's not that they're fighting each other directly. So like you might have an employee, for example, who's very focused on, I'm frustrated with these processes that keep breaking down. And you have a manager who's frustrated with the employee who has a bad attitude about those processes breaking down. So then when they discuss, the employee's talking about, we got to fix the processes. And the manager's talking about, no, we got to fix the attitude. And they're talking about two different things. They're missing each other in terms of the conversation. So it's important when you get into a conflict situation to listen to the other side. If you're an employee and you are frustrated with your job and you have, a, if you show up with a list of demands for your boss to fulfill, that's not a good mindset to go into the conflict with. What you got to do is go into the conversation and say, hey, I'm kind of feeling these things. Give me your, tell me more. Give me like, what's, what input do you have for me? Your goal is to draw out more information so that you can find out exactly where it is that we're stuck. What does that look like? Yeah. And I keep thinking through this conversation of like, um, you know, having friends I know in the business world who are really conflict averse. And so they're more prone to like the, like ghosting or the passive aggressive, or if we just ignore it, it'll go away. And that's almost never true. You know, like sometimes there are things and we have to be honest with ourselves of, do I just need to let this go? Like, is this just a personal preference and maybe it's not that big of a deal and do I need to let it go? But um, like, I just been thinking of one friend in partic particular who really struggles with conflict in the workplace and she'll almost never bring it up. And that's one way to do it. But then what happens is then she ends up feeling really resentful toward those people um, to the point where she's left jobs before, you know, because it's just like, it just all built up to this point or, or then like the volcano explodes and maybe we've all been in a workplace before where we've seen someone or like the volcano explodes and everybody else goes, Whoa, like, where did that come from? And this person's like, well, for years, now you've been saying and doing this or the last six months. And then we hear things like you never, you always. So um, what I would say is it's, it's almost always to use that term, the wrong choice to just ignore it. 
But to take everyone else's point, like if you're really upset about it, you're really angry, then it's also probably not the right time to bring it up. If you can't kind of get into this frame where you're willing to be a little vulnerable, where you're willing to be a little wrong, or even you're just willing to hear someone else's perspective on it, then it's probably not the right time to bring it up, but also don't like, let that go forever. Don't, don't wait months, you know, Mm -hmm. to talk about things. Yeah. I was listening. This reminded me of some, some podcasts that I was listening to about conflict and having these difficult conversations. And, you know, you guys were talking about asking lots of questions and in the process. And one of the things that was stated in one of these podcasts, and I'm sorry, I can't remember which one, there was like a string of them, um, said that like being asked questions is actually going to make your counterpart like you more. (laughs) So that's sort of a trick to, to it, that it's like, it automatically like takes barriers down for both sides of it. It's helpful for your brain going into it to be able to ask questions because you're getting more information, but it also makes the other person in the conversation feel like you're listening to them and you're trying to show interest in them as a person. And they're less afraid of the conflict that could be there potentially too. And so, um, anyways, I think I just wanted to add that because I think that is, it seems really simple, but it's really great um, it's a really great piece of advice. Um, the the other thing that I think come from that too that I was reminded of is like those elaboration questions. So um, you might start by asking the first question, but but ask the ask the person that you're having the conversation, ask that next question, and ask them to elaborate on what they just said um, because that's going to keep you from asking pointed questions. I think so. It's just the type of question you ask is important too. I think this conflict avoidance thing also, you know, we've talked a lot about quiet quitting and ghosting, which a lot of times is applied, you know, especially the quiet quitting is applied usually to employees. But I think the management's perspective of that or version of that sometimes, and you guys are going to laugh, but is is sometimes surveys. I don't want to talk to my employees to find out what's going on. I'm going to passively survey them and then take the data and put information in what, yes, while those are questions, they're not necessarily direct engagements, opportunities to be able to work with employees. Or like in, I've mentioned the uh, nursing strike in New York, one of the at one of the protests, the nurses brought pizza boxes. And the reason that they have the pizza boxes is they've been asking for all of these different things that they need. They want like better, safe, safer environments, you know, better working conditions, those types of things. And what administration was doing in those hospitals was they were buying them pizza you know, when they had to work really late or extra things, which is very nice. And no one would say that they hate pizza, but I think that- Yeah, I don't want to take pizza off the table. We don't want to take pizza off the table, right? We will not take pizza off the table. Pizza is very good. And it is a a team building activity, all the good things for pizza. Pizza does many, many things for you, but it can't replace a good conversation. You can't go, management sometimes says, I'm worried that man, if my employees are upset and we've seen managers do this, I'm going to avoid them. And in fact, and what I'll do instead is show them that I appreciate them through passive means. Like I'm going to do something, I'll buy you something, or I'll put some food out there in the break room, or I'll send out a passive card or something like that. Again, it's not anti the card thing. It just doesn't replace the other con- the other pieces to that. So as we've talked about these different forms of uh, conflict avoidance that are very common, I think sometimes how we, do, I think employee surveys can be not, again, we're not anti-employee survey. Uh, we do those a lot of times for companies and with a lot of success and it helps to take that data, but it doesn't replace those other conversations. And I think it's up to the reason we wanted to do this topic is quiet quitting. If you're sitting out there, you might be thinking, I've heard people say, I'm not, it's not up to me to fix my employer. But if you have quiet quit, the message there is you're avoiding conflict. You are, first of all, you are avoiding a chance to potentially make your job better for yourself and for your employer. Second of all, it's just not good for you. It's a bad habit to get into. Avoiding that conflict altogether, avoiding those critical conversations uh, just creates a lot of of turmoil. It doesn't allow you to build trust. It makes you feel more alone. It makes you, it reduces your job satisfaction, all those different things. It reduces psychological safety. And I think that's why we wanted to pick up this topic. 
Yeah, ultimately, we're not saying uh, no conflict. We're just saying healthy conflict. Sometimes we help organizations do what we refer to as fight fair. Like you're going to fight. It's like any it's like any relationship or any partnership. Like there's going to be some sort of conflict that you have. We just want to help you fight fair. And part of the part of the way of fighting fair is maybe utilizing some of the tips that you all, um, you know, that, that we that we shared here. I say you all as my team that my team has shared with uh, with you all. So hopefully you're able to take something from that and at least take that first step. Sometimes you might not have any idea how it's going to uh, solve itself, which might be part of the scary part. But what we would do is challenge you just take that first step. Um, most likely, if you are frustrated, they're also frustrated. Somebody's got to take that first step. So I would encourage you to have that conversation. If you have other feedback or other questions about uh, this topic or any other topics you'd like us to uh, talk about, feel free to listen to the outro, get a hold of us. We love to interact with our, uh, 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 not fans, you're not fans. Maybe you are fans. I don't know, people, with the people. We like to interact with the, with the people. So anyway, feel free to re reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. Feel free to share the podcast. We love our listeners. Hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks for joining. Thank you for listening to the People Centered Podcast. We are so grateful for you joining us every week. If you like this content, please like and subscribe. Also, feel free to share on your social media with everyone that you know. It really does help us. If you would like to contact us, I have put our information in the show notes. Please reach out anytime. We love hearing from you. We will be back next week with a new topic. Until then, be well and need well.